uh hello can everybody hear me yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome everyone and, and good morning to all uh now that everybody has assembled for today's webinar i would like to request our honorable principal ma'am uh, to kindly inaugurate the session and share a few words with us ma'am to inaugurate the departmental webinar in the department of english at 11:30 am on popular digital by professor shishakto de um, actually we are organizing departmental webinars in order to be associated with all our students and to be the source person who can deliver lectures which can benefit us and also our students now uh, during pandemic we could not hold classes we could not hold any seminars in the auditorium of the college so we plan a series of webinars so that we can be you know uh, in touch with our dear students we are organizing this webinar along with the internal quality assurance cell who coordinated is dr aditi shortar and i'm thankful to all my colleagues in the department of english head of the department dr malavika shortar dr rolla nihoniyogi professor mitorik varma and professor sin mohite all their efforts to possible to hold this webinar today the topic we have chosen it is actually it can be interdisciplinary in the sense that it is popular literature so i took a few of other departmental colleagues were interested to join with us in the webinar so that they can also be benefited from the webinar so without further delay I inaugurate this session, and I wish all the success to the webinar. The department. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for inaugurating the session and for your encouraging words. I would now now request the head of the department, Dr. Malavika Sharkar, to provide an introductory note on today's topic, popular literature. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Mitri, and good morning, everyone. Uh, let me at first thank our principal, Dr. Indrila Guho. This webinar has, was her idea, and we can never thank her enough for her confidence in us, for her positive approach, and for her immense enthusiasm, which is not uh, just inspiring but almost infectious, if I may use the word, drawing us along even during these very trying times. And speaking of infection. 
our student Akashi Dotto of semester three honors has very recently tested positive for corona. On behalf of us all here today, I wish her a speedy recovery. Uh, may her family as well be safe. I now extend a very warm welcome to Professor Shiddhatta De of the Department of English, Higanogol Government College, which is, is, is in fact the last college I worked in before, I, before joining this college. Uh, I thank him for agreeing to deliver this year's special lecture. Um, and he'll be speaking on popular literature, which is a very crucial area in literary study and research today. And it is introduced uh, to the undergrad students at the uh, third semester level. And it's not just uh, a very important area of research today, but it's also of popular interest. The reason why, you know, uh, people from other departments, we expect them to join us today to hear this lecture. And I'm sure we will all gain valuable insights from his lecture. Uh, this event is all the more special, made so by the presence of my esteemed colleague, uh, the college ECAC coordinator, Dr. Aditi Shortar. And before she addresses us all, I would like to request everyone once more, just to remind them to put their microphone on mute. Thank you so much, Mithuri. Um, thank you, Malabi Sadi, for your, for your uh, kind words. Uh, I would now request the IQAC convener, Dr. Aditi Sharkar, uh, who is the associate professor of the Department of Education, uh, to address the students and provide us with some remarks regarding this evening. Thank you, Mithuri. Good morning, dear participants. First and foremost, we pray for quick recovery of our dear student. A very warm welcome to all of you in today's webinar on popular literature organized by the Department of English in collaboration with Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Bashanti Devi College, Kolkata. We all are aware of the fact that the present COVID-19 pandemic has adversely affected our conventional classroom teaching learning process. In order to cope with the new normal, different departments of our college have been organizing series of webinars in collaboration with IQAC for students, teachers, and others under the continuous encouragement and guidance of our respected principal, madam. Today, we have with us an eminent speaker, Professor Shiddha Tode from the Department of English, Bidhanagar Government College. Hope it will be a very interesting and enriching webinar. Our sincere thanks to the faculty of the Department of English of our college, Dr. Rolla Guhoniyogi, Dr. Malubika Sharkar, head of the department, Professor Mithurik Borma, and Professor Chinmoy De for collectively organizing today's webinar. I believe we all will be very much benefited from today's webinar. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you. Over to Mithurik. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Aditi, for your kind words. Uh, now, since uh, all of us uh, has already uh, assembled in the video conference, I think uh, without uh, wasting much time, we can just start the session now. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Professor Siddharth Tode, Assistant Professor at the Department of English at Vidhanagar College under the government of West Bengal. He is currently researching on consciousness studies and narratology at Presidency University and he is primarily interested in contemporary British fiction, particularly postmodern fiction. Uh, he is also very modest and provided me little information on his academic background. But as far as I know, he is a good scholar and an excellent speaker. Also, if I remember correctly, he was uh, the topper in the PhD exam in his first attempt. So uh, I would now kindly request him to take over and provide his special lecture on today's topic. <clears throat> Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, Mithuri, could you just uh, stay unmuted for the entire stretch so that in case I need to communicate anything, I can just talk to you because I, I think all the rest are, have already muted themselves. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. 
good morning everyone uh, i'm really humbled that uh, you chose me to uh, talk to you today uh, the subject that i'm going to talk about is uh, as uh, your teachers have already said that it's it's a, it's a topic of uh, decent interest in recent times <coughs> But uh, I'm very thankful that the organizers have uh, left the topic very open to me. So popular literature, they haven't provided me with any particular uh, approach with which I need to uh, address the audience today. Uh, so I have decided to restrict myself to three primary questions, which I think are of uh, considerable interest uh, for today's discussion. But before that, I would like to uh, begin with two apologies. So one apology is uh, I will not be talking about comic books. I, I think uh, comic books are a matter of uh, interest amongst uh, students, UG and PG both. But I won't be talking about comic books primarily because I think comic books uh, dwell in a, uh, in a different uh, terrain. So they, they remain in an intersecting space between uh, culture and literature, between art and literature. Uh, so I will not be talking about comic books. And uh, second is I shall try to theorize as little as possible. Uh, because I think you are already stuffed with uh, the Walter Benjamin, the Adorno, the Horkheimer and all those theorists whose names are very frequently evoked uh, in context of popular literature, in context of postmodernism and the merging of the high culture and low culture. But I will try to refrain from referring to the theorists as much as possible. So with that, let me uh, begin. Uh, I need to share the screen here. Midori, please let me know if uh, the presentation is visible. Yeah, yeah, it's visible to all. Okay, okay. Thank you. So the three questions that I uh, primarily want to ask myself today, and uh, I hope that we would uh, reach some sort of an answer by the end of this discussion to all these three. Number one is what is popular literature? Number two is how is it different from mainstream literature? And number three, what is it doing in the academia? Now, coming to the first question, we need to ask uh, that what is popular literature? Now, if we think the most basic meaning of the word popular, that is someone who is very well received or well acknowledged or loved by many uh, in the sense that Virat Kohli is a popular cricketer or Cristiano Ronaldo is probably the most popular man on the planet. So if we consider the most simplest meaning of the word popular, then there comes a problem. Consider these two gentlemen, Charles Dickens and Sir Walter Scott, both extremely popular during their lifetimes. Uh, Charles Dickens was somewhat of a celebrity author. He, he was a best-selling author. He took his novels on tours. He would uh, give presentations, readings from his novels to enthralled audiences, and he would earn a huge amount of money. Same with Sir Walter Scott. Scott, interestingly, would contemplate on his own popularity uh, quite a lot in letters written to uh, friends and acquaintances. And he also earned a lot of money. Consider this fact, the fortunes of Nigel sold 7,000 copies in the first morning of publication. And this is 1822. But these people, Charles Dickens or Walter Scott, or there are many others, they are never studied as part of popular literature courses anywhere. They are very firmly literary figures. They are very firmly placed in the context of mainstream literature. So definitely popular in this case does not mean someone who is simply well sold or well received by many. The second term is more problematic. That is literature. I think there are so many people here today uh, listening to this. There are professors, there are students, 
And I don't think that any two of them will agree about a definition of literature, right? Because this is always a very dicey, very vague, very flexible, very protean term, literature. Uh, but there's one definition that I find very useful. I, I came across it somewhere, which I don't exactly remember. I later uh, you know, frantically searched on the net for its source, but couldn't locate it. Uh, and the definition is literature is what university professors decide to be literature, right? So you can understand that this is a very tricky definition, although it is probably the most appropriate one. Now, if literature is what university professors decide to be literature, then we are once again on dicey ground because something that is considered trash today might be included into the ambit of literature tomorrow simply because some professor happens to take a liking for it. Right? Therefore, for our purpose today, we will use a totally different term, not popular literature, but the term that is used everywhere outside the university, be it bookstores, be it amongst readers, be it amongst publishers, the term that they use is popular fiction. Okay? Because uh, popular literature mostly comes uh, as in, in the form of fiction, uh, in the form of novel. And fiction, I think, is easier to define. Fiction, simply speaking, is any story that is partly or entirely imaginary. Now, these days, fiction mostly comes in form of novels. So we can say novels as well. And popular, we need to redefine it, not only uh, well sold or well received, but something that is intended for the people and shaped primarily by the demands of the people. Now, this takes us to another question. Who are these people? Anyone, like anyone can qualify as people, even, even the king on his knees is a layman. So we need to be clear about who are these people. Are these people the masses? Now, this is a word, masses, that is very commonly used by theorists of popular culture. Now, although literature is a subset, we can, we can consider popular fiction as a subset of popular culture. But I think we cannot exactly use the word masses for popular fiction because therein lies a problem. The problem is masses is roughly defined as people without access to approved means of cultural capital, be it economic or symbolic. Simply speaking, people who do not have access to much money or education or status or other symbolic capital that exists in society. Plainly speaking, it's the arm janta right, that, that we often refer to in our vernacular. But we cannot use the word arm janta or we cannot use the word masses in context of popular fiction because literature is a unique cultural product which requires a basic level of literacy. Even the most illiterate man can have an instantaneous response to other cultural forms. For example, music. Someone who is totally unacquainted with classical music can still respond if a, classic, if a piece of classical music is being played in front of him. And he can either like it or dislike it. That won't be a studied response, but a response nonetheless. Same with food, same with painting, but not so for books. If you are reading, for example, a novel by Chetan Bhagat, and I think it's a, it is a truth universally acknowledged that uh, Chetan Bhagat is a, an epitome of popular fiction. Even if you are reading uh, a book by Chetan Bhagat, you need to have a basic level of literacy. You know English. You can read English for uh, 200, 250 pages. So you are not part of the masses. Add to that the fact that there are many genres of uh, popular fiction which have a very limited readership. Horror, for example. The genre of horror, be it, be it fiction, be it films, is avoided deliberately by a lot of people. And horror has a very limited readership, very limited viewership even in case of films. And horror writers and horror readers they always locate themselves in a marginal space, in some sort of a liminal space. So you can call them subcultural, 
or countercultural, but not mass culture. So why do we still use the word popular, popular fiction for something that is not for the masses and not even being read by many people in some cases, obviously? Because popular fiction can only be understood in terms of what it is not. That is, it is not literary fiction. So popular fiction is usually the opposite of literary fiction. Now, how can we uh, divide the two? How can we distinguish the two? This takes us to the second question. That is, pop what is popular fiction and what is literary fiction? How are they two different? Or are they that different at all? Now, the primary difference that people usually talk about while talking about popular fiction is that popular fiction is focused on the story. That is what is being told. Whereas literary fiction is focused on style. That is how it is being told. Of course, to the story may or may not matter, but the style matters the most for literary fiction. Therefore, the language of literary fiction is often minimalist. It leaves more gaps. It allows the reader to participate more actively into the reading. It lets the reader think, ponder over a single sentence. That is not the case with much of popular fiction. Popular fiction has a maximalist language. That is, everything is shown in front of you. The reader, in many cases, in case of popular fiction, that is, is just a passive recipient, as if the story is happening in front of your eyes and you are passively watching it happen. But is this divide absolute? Now, I, I, I don't think so. This, this, is, this is a general division that is, be, that is made, but I don't think that this is an absolute division. Dorothy L. Sayers, who was a contemporary of Agatha Christie and one of the uh, most well-known names of the golden age of crime writing in England, referred to the two kinds of crime fiction. Crime fiction, incidentally, is one of the most popular genres amongst popular fiction. And the two kinds of crime fiction that she refers to are the purely intellectual and the purely sensational. So I think you understand that she is distinguishing between the purely sensational crime novel, which is more story, more action, more tension, more suspense, and the purely intellectual crime novel, which makes the reader think. Right? So here you have, within the ambit of popular fiction, one kind of popular fiction, which Dorothy L. Sears calls the purely intellectual crime fiction, which makes the reader think, maybe. There are numerous crime novelists who are very highly regarded by literary artists, like Raymond Chandler, for example, is considered almost unambiguously as a master. He was strongly admired by literary writers such as W. H. Auden, such as Evelyn Waugh. Look at this Patricia Highsmith in her book Plotting and Writing Suspense Fiction, says, the beauty of the suspense genre is that a writer can write profound thoughts and have some sections without physical action if he wishes to, because the framework is an essentially lively story. Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment is a splendid example of this. In fact, I think most of Dostoevsky's books would be called suspense books, where they're being published today for the first time. So here you have Dostoevsky, acknowledged as one of the literary greats, one of the masters of Russian literature. And Patricia Highsmith says that Dostoevsky's stories were suspense stories. Literary masters such as Jane Austen. I, I, I believe that all of you are familiar with Jane Austen. She is widely taught in university syllabi across the world. Now, one thing that I believe all of you will agree is that when we think of someone like Agatha Christie, we think of the mathematical precision with which she builds up her, builds up her plots. Right? It's very, very, it's almost a geometric mind that is behind the plots. Something that happens in chapter three 
comes back as a clue or as a hint in chapter 37. You know? And by the end of it, everything, everything is accounted for. I think you find the same with someone like Jane Austen. And I think that is one of Jane Austen's lasting contribution to uh, English literature, the perfection of employment. No loose ends whatsoever. Something, a, a little comment that is made uh, in chapter 7 comes back in chapter 60 and plays a crucial role in the movement of the plot. So Jane Austen undoubtedly is a master of the plot. Take a contemporary artist, a contemporary literary writer like Ian McEwan. In his novels, although his novels are very much literary fiction, you find suspense, you find slow buildup of atmospheric tension, you find in many cases a crime, like a murder or an adultery, you find a plot twist. Now, these are things that you associate usually with popular fiction, but you can find them in literary writers as well. So the distinction of style and story I don't think is that absolute as we think it to be. Then is there a difference in originality and industry? I think this is uh, slightly more uh, appropriate in case of popular fiction and literary fiction. And here is Walter Scott writing uh, at the beginning of his novel, The Abbot. I have looked round my library and could not but observe that from the time of Chaucer to that of Byron, the most popular authors had been the most prolific. And the successful author is a productive laborer. Now, this is a very key point of popular fiction. You write a single novel, you stand a chance to become a literary great. Emily Bronte, for example, one novel and literary great. Close to home. One novel considered as a literary great. But you can never be a popular writer by writing just one novel. So the writing of popular fiction and literary fiction slightly differ. Whereas the writer of literary fiction spends hours, you know, like hours to write one single sentence. The writer of popular fiction tries to have more sentences in an hour. So in case of popular fiction, the language of art, I think, is subordinated to the language of industry. Scott himself wrote more than 25 novels, 15 books of nonfiction, 10 volumes of poetry and several plays and short story collections. Now, if I ask you, who is the most popular writer of the late 19th century, of the second half of the Victorian era? I think most of you will talk about uh, maybe Hardy or uh, maybe Anthony Trollope or maybe Mrs. Gaskell, because these are the authors you have studied about in your literature courses, but none of them. It was Marie Corelli, almost forgotten now, but uh, thankfully recently I have seen some interest, uh, a wave of interest emerging about Marie Corelli's novels. He was Britain's best-selling writer and the most popular writer by a distance. She wrote 40 novels and this particular novel, The Sorrows of Satan, published in 1895, right? the same year incidentally uh, when uh, Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscure was burnt at stake uh, for charges of obscenity. Uh, this novel, The Sorrows of Satan, it broke all previous publishing records. And interestingly, this novel is about a very talented literary writer who hires the devil as his literary agent, but still is no match for a woman who keeps writing popular fiction one after another. And look at this number, 10,000 pounds for a single title. Publishers advances around 10,000 pounds a single title. 100 years back, uh, for an annual, annual income of 10,000 pounds, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy was considered the most eligible bachelor in the entire neighborhood. And here you have Marie Corelli earning 10,000 pounds of advance 
for every single title. And you can see the illustrious readers that she had. So as you can see, the difference between a one-off novelist, be, be him a literary novelist or not, and a long-term successful and popular writer is that the long-term writer has to do it repeatedly, has to do it again and again and again. Now, that is one reason why one of the most common charges uh, that have been labeled against uh, popular fiction is that it is formulaic. It is, it is repetitive, it uses the same trope over and over again. I think that's partly true. Uh, for example, if, if you look at, uh, say, uh, modern Indian uh, web series that are, that are very popular online, uh, starting from Sacred Games or Mirzapur or Patallo, Delhi Crime, very, very similar uh, tropes, the police inspector, the underworld, the crime underworld, uh, people with vested interests, politicians who are corrupt, right, have very similar uh, tropes being used. So I, I think uh, popular fiction is definitely formulaic to a certain extent, but we should warn ourselves against uh, dismissing popular fiction simply as formulaic. Because if we look a bit more closely, I think literature too have very formulaic genres. What can be more formulaic than the epic? The first things that you learn while studying epic is the epic features. The invocation, the causa, the epic hero, the epic simile, the journey to the under, underworld, the epic voyage, the epic battle. Right? So very formulaic. So you need to understand this formulaic repetition in context of what can be said the driving force of popular fiction, and that is genre. Now the entire field of popular fiction is written for, marketed, and consumed. I'm using the word consumed uh, instead of read but I'm doing that very deliberately, written for, marketed, and consumed genrically. You know, genre is the primary logic of popular fiction. To know about a popular fiction writer is to know what genre he or she practices. So you know, for example, that Agatha Christie is a writer of murder mysteries. You know that Clive Barker is a writer of horror. You know that George Ethier is a writer of uh, romance. Isaac Asimov is a sci-fi writer. So you immediately associate the writers with their genres. And literature, on the other hand, literary fiction, on the other hand, is often thought to have transcended all genre. So it is a higher state which you reach when you have transcended all genre limitations. There's one interesting anecdote in, uh, in this case that I would like to uh, relate. And this is something that Janet Winterson herself related in a preface to a later edition of the book. When her uh, first novel, uh, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, uh, which is now considered as a, as a modern classic somewhat. Uh, so when her first novel, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, was published in the year 1985, she was absolutely a new writer and people had no clue that who is this writer. And it, it is a difficult novel. So I think most people did not have an idea that what this book is about. So this book was placed in bookstores on the cookbook sections. People thought since it has oranges on the title, it must be about uh, some sort of a recipe book for making marmalade. And then uh, some readers uh, informed the bookstore owners that no, 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 this is not a cookbook. This is a, this is a fiction. And the protagonist is lesbian. And immediately the book was uh, transferred to the gay lesbian fiction section queer fiction category. Now, later that year, uh, the book won a lot of literary awards, including the very prestigious Whitbread Prize. And immediately, the book made its way on top of the shelves that have on them labeled literary fiction. So once you transcend all the genres, you climb up and sit in the category of literary fiction. But even literature or literary fiction is often divided into genre identities. 
right? The modernist novel, the novel of manners, for example, the Bildungsroman, the postmodern novel. There are genre categories in literary fiction as well. But there is a difference. In literary fiction, the genre category is not immediately recognizable. With popular fiction, genre categories are on your face. Genre categories are the life force of uh, popular fiction. So if you are reading a literary fiction, for example, so let's say you are reading a popular fiction, you're reading a sci-fi. What are you reading? I'm reading a sci-fi or I'm reading a romance or I'm, I'm reading a fantasy. It's that evident. But imagine you reading a uh, portrait of the artist as a young man. If someone asks you, please don't tell them that I'm reading a Kunstler roman. Right? So it, it, it's not that evident. It, it, it's simply literary fiction. Okay? You, you need not know what is Kunstler roman. You need not know what is Bildung's roman. You just read the novel. And then maybe you think about its genre, you, you analyze the genre, you analyze its relation with the genre, but not immediately. Genre fiction requires a knowledge of its history. Reading genre fiction, writing genre fiction, publishing genre fiction, selling genre fiction requires a very detailed knowledge of the history of that genre and of what you are supposed to expect of that genre. This history involves not only readers and writers, but at, at times even publishers. Classic example, you know, where the publisher is almost synonymous with the genre is Mills and Boone. Okay. So, you see some some of the details are here they they uh, even now they publish 700 romance novels a year to such an extent mills and boone is synonymous to romance novels to such an extent that one doesn't remember the name of the title name of name of the book or the, or even the name of the author they simply say that i i am reading a mills and boone novel right so when things are better you can just walk to uh, uh, Gold Park, and they have uh, loads of Mills and Boone stacked in those second-hand bookstores, and and you you won't even know the name of the writer. You won't even remember. No one would ask you who is the writer of this book. It's just a Mills and Boone. You tell someone I'm reading a Mills and Boone, and he or she knows what you're reading. Right? It's that synonymous. In many cases, the author is very unimportant. Of course, unless there are certain authors, I, I can think of uh, Barbara Parkland, for example, probably the most well known of uh, all romance writers of recent times, and she published 500 novels in her lifetime. Yes, you heard that right. 500 novels in her lifetime, published novels. Take, for example, the genre of crime, right? Always endorsed by other crime writers. Always endorsed by other crime writers. This novel, John Bardet's Bangkok Eight, thrilling novel. Uh, you can give it a read. Uh, wonderful setting, uh, wonderful theme. The very first scene uh, uh, in, in a crowded Bangkok road. Uh, on a crowded Bangkok road, uh, you have a Mercedes car, and in that Mercedes car, there is a dead body of, of a business tycoon, and on that corpse, there are uh, you know crawling poisonous snakes all over. And uh, throughout the novel, there are spatterings of Buddhist philosophy. So it's a, quite an interesting uh, blend therein. But look at the endorsements. Carl Hyacin and James Elroy. Elroy both well-known crime fiction writers by their own right, endorsing this new novel. So they are, in fact, encouraging Bardet or welcoming Bardet into the territory in which they are already established. And yes, and also comparing Bardet's novel with Gorky Park, which is another very renowned American thriller novel. Look what is happening here. The first two novels, the first two covers, Kalki and Narasimha, right. written by Kevin Misal, 21-year-old or 22-year-old uh, young writer, Kevin Misal. 
writing Kalki and Narasimha, these are avatar of Vishnu, I haven't read them, but uh, uh, the covers are interesting, avatar of Vishnu and the Mahavatar trilogy, whatever. And look how similar, how similar the covers are to these two covers, Scion of Ikshaku and Sita. Popular novels written by a popular writer, Amish Tripathi, writer of uh, mythological thrillers, if I might say, mythological thrillers, which are very popular these days amongst young Indian people. So this young writer, uh, uh, Kevin Misal, is having covers designed in such a way so that people think that he is writing in that genre which Amish Tripathi practices. So immediately you have to place it in the genre and therefore definitely there is there is some repetitiveness there are some there are some similarities uh, between novels at times it's formulaic at times the similar tropes are used similar covers okay at times even similar title uh, since Stig Larsson became uh, popular there are so many girl novels the girl with this the girl with that the girl on the train the girl on that okay uh, I, I couldn't resist the temptation of sharing this uh, Instagram photo by the popular romance uh, Indian uh, author Durjoy Dotto, who seems to be living in genre as well, uh, wearing similar clothes for all family members. Okay. Now, marketing. How about marketing genre? Genre fiction is marketed in a very commercial context. There are differences of publishers. There are particular publishers who sell only genre fiction. Like Pan became very popular after selling the James Bond novels. Like Mills and Boone that I talked about. But on the other hand, you have publishers that publish only literary books. And how do they sell them? With a new introduction. Okay. So Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels with a new introduction by Jeanette Winters with another new introduction by another important uh, literary writer and footnotes, detailed footnotes. So literary fiction almost always is placed in an educational context, in an academic context. Popular fiction is sold differently. It has the publicity blurbs on the covers, the shout out loud at you, the positive reviews on the covers. So it's clearly in a commercial context. And believe it or not, there are genre bookshops. There are genre bookstores. Take, for example, this bookstore uh, at Charing Cross, London. Uh, unfortunately, they have closed uh, a few years back. They were very active. Uh, but that is happening worldwide anyway. Bookstores are closing. That is not nothing to do with genre. Uh, but Murder One uh, on Charing Cross, London, very thriving, very popular, as you can understand, crime fiction bookstore. A genre bookstore, you know, they, they construct a cultural network around the genre, around the fiction. Genre booksellers are often avid readers. They often know more than the consumers. They need to recommend to the consumers. And here is one uh, particular bookstore that I, that I want to show you. It will take a bit of time, but uh, please bear with me. This is in Maine. In the USA. No, I'm, I'm showing you. Uh, just a minute. <coughs> First one was called the Zigzag Man. Ask the owners, and it's no mystery to them, why their little shop packs them in. It's a very popular genre. We, we like it. Millions of other people like it. Ann Whetstone and Paula Keeney run Mainly Murder's bookstore from a converted old carriage house tucked away in the backyard of their home in Kennebunk. Retired teachers, the two have forever shared a passion for murder mysteries, 
and a notion to one day sell them. But we always knew, we started talking about this about 40 some years ago. We wanted to open a bookstore that people wanted to come to, and we wanted to open a bookstore that we knew stuff about the books. Over the decades, the two have amassed a collection of some 10,000 murder mystery books. About 3,500 jammed the store shelves. And while Anne and Paula cannot claim to have read every single title. Between the two of us, we've probably read every author in here. Together, they travel the world each winter searching for new authors. Back home, they sift through local library sales and flea markets to keep their inventory stocked. Virtually all of their books are secondhand. Great reads, they say, at great bargains. I mean, who in Maine doesn't like thrift? This bookstore has exceeded all of our expectations. We thought it would be successful because we're very much aware of, of how mysteries are, the popularity of mysteries. A bit off the beaten Main Street path, but for anyone into murder mysteries, it's well worth investigating. If not for the sheer number of books, but for everything these two know about them. I describe Ad as the person with the, with the darker interests. If there's a story about serial killers, me not so much. Uh, we say that I, I like the softer side of murder. Two such innocent looking women. Who would ever guess so much murder on their minds? Yes, yeah, so uh, there you have the mainly murder bookstore that stacks murder mysteries. And you have uh, two old women uh, who are more, more well read into the genre than the readers who will probably come and, and buy the books from them. Am I audible? Or... Yeah, you're audible. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so here you have the Romance Writers of America. This is a very well known organization in America, and uh, there are, I think, more than uh, 10,000 members, uh, 10,000 or even more, like uh, 15, 20,000 members worldwide. Uh, out, out of which uh, there are more than 3,000 uh, members who are writers, who are writers of the romance genre. And they say that the, the marriage, uh, the, the union between uh, romance bookstores and their writers is a marriage made in heaven. And here are six tips that is there on the Romance Writers of America website for new romance bookstores, people who might uh, feel encouraged to open romance bookstores should take a look at these tips. Staff your store with several romance experts who are familiar with the genre and can recommend similar titles and anticipate bestsellers. Once romance readers discover a new author, they will want to read her backlist. So you should have knowledgeable people, people who could uh, give the readers the backlist of a particular author. Schedule in-store author book signings and promotional events. Coordinate a romance readers group from among your faithful romance customers, romance reading book clubs. Display and promote books that have won the RWA awards, that's the Romance Writer of America awards. And introduce romance fiction to new readers who may not realize the diversity, fun, and downright good reading that romance fiction has to offer. So you can see genre bookstores play a very crucial part in the dissemination, in the selling, in the widespread of genre fiction or popular fiction uh, worldwide. Another way of uh, disseminating genre fiction is genre magazines. These days uh, you have more of those uh, e-zines or pro-zines, okay, run mostly by readers and fans worldwide. But genre magazines played a very crucial role, at least in the uh, first half uh, of the 20th century. The, the pulp magazines, as they are known as, 
This magazine, for example, The Weird Tales, they still exist. At least uh, their website is still there. You can even find it online. This magazine, Weird Tales, had a very shaky history. They, they started in 23 and then closed down in 54. Uh, they resurfaced in 73, then again in 81, and then finally it is running from 1998. It's, it's well known for its, for its ghost stories, stories about vampires, stories about uh, you know, supernatural, and perhaps fittingly because of the subject that they uh, write about and uh, their particularly shaky history, they have a subtitle called The Magazine That Never Dies. Okay, so it, it's indeed about uh, things that never die, and also it's a magazine that never died. It, it published stories by now acknowledged as great writers as H.P. Lovecraft, Ray Bradbury, and interestingly, Robert Bloch wrote Psycho in Weird Tales. Had a very wide readership, very, very wide readership, involving people from diverse backgrounds. And, and one interesting note that I couldn't... Uh, resist sharing is this one that a reader wrote to the editor that as a professional grave digger I have particular interest in your magazine because it writes about the corpses and ghosts that come out. Much of popular fiction have been successful in building a brand now, this is a very interesting case. These are very, very, very important uh, words that Jonathan Franzen, who is, who is once again a very literary uh, fiction writer, uh, wrote in one of his essays called Why Bother? He writes, the consumer economy loves a product that sells at a premium, wears out quickly, or is susceptible to regular improvement, and offers with each improvement some marginal gain in usefulness. Okay. It's like an iPhone. Okay. So you had three cameras in iPhone uh, 10, you have four cameras in iPhone 11. Oh, pardon me if I get this wrong, but, but that is the you know, marginal improvement in uh, usefulness. But in effect, at the end of the day, it's the same brand, it's the iPhone. It's the same set of uh, features that you get only with marginal uh, advantages, marginal usefulness. And there are so many ways that a brand can be built. A brand can be built around the writer, a brand can be built around the character. Look at this, for example. Perhaps the most popular writer in the world today, uh, and certainly the most popular writer in America, Stephen King. If you have to figure out what is the title of the novel, you just have to look very closely. Where is the title? Okay. Oh, this is Salem's Lot. Okay, this is Carrie. But one thing that you cannot overlook is the name of the author. These are very different covers from very different editions, but note the one thing that is common, the name of the writer, just staring out at you, Stephen King. So Stephen King is in himself a brand. At times, characters can become brands. Sherlock Holmes, James Bond, Harry Potter, classic examples of how characters can become brands. And one of the ways in which a character uh, can become a brand is serialization. Arthur Conan Doyle, within a span of 40 years, wrote 56 short stories and four novels about Sherlock Holmes. When he started writing Sherlock Holmes, he would be paid 30 guineas per story. By 1902, he was being paid 480 to 620 pounds per episode. That is for per issue of the magazine. So this is how a brand is built. And a brand often continues beyond the writer. It is a very well-known fact that many authors, many authors, in fact, I was checking the bibliography of authors who have written about uh, with the character of Sherlock Holmes, and, and it's a staggering number, 127 authors. 127 authors since the death of Arthur Conan Doyle have written stories 
featuring the character of Sherlock Holmes, including literary greats such as Mark Twain or Anthony Burgess. Same with Agatha Christie. Look at these covers. They are not written by Agatha Christie. They are written by Sophie Hanna, the very contemporary writer. They are all very recent novels. So one thing that is, uh, you know, very prominent on all the covers is the name Agatha Christie, so that it appears to be Agatha Christie novels, so that they look like Agatha Christie novels. And you can't find the name of Sophie Hanna anywhere in the cover. Oh, okay, there, there she is, right at the bottom. Same characters, similar plot lines. So novels that are that feel like Agatha Christie novels. And who doesn't know Harry Potter? Okay, probably one of the one of the biggest brands, one of the biggest media brands that we have seen while growing up. We had grown up in the 90s, so uh, we were literally growing up with Harry. And it's one of the biggest brands that we have seen emerge from the field of uh, popular fiction. It's, its current estimate is $25 billion. And would you believe it that Harry Potter has been translated into Latin? Like, who reads Latin these days? No one reads Latin. But Harry Potter has been translated into Latin. Such a, such a huge brand it is. And it's not only about the book. It is about the merchandise. And, and you can see J.K. Rowling literally struggling hard to cash in more and more with, with, with the brand. She's, she's doing this and that. She's writing screenplay, theaters and all that. Explanatory guides to Harry Potter, encyclopedias about Harry Potter. She's doing her best to cash in on the brand that she has created. Now, where does the reader stand amidst all this? This is a crazy world. This is a crazy market. Popular fiction, genre fiction is a crazy world. Where does the reader stand? Are we supposed to uh, understand that popular fiction and literary fiction are to be read differently? Now, here, is, uh, here are some of the differences that uh, P.F. Bourdieu, the French sociologist, made in his book, The Field of Cultural Production. And one, one very interesting point that he makes in that work is that the literary fiction writer is more often than not autonomous and is indifferent towards the readers, at times contemptuous. At not only indifferent, at times they are very contemptuous of the reading public, of this market of book selling and all that. They emphasize on their creativity and their originality. And this is something that, that I think emerged uh, since romant the Romantic movement and then gained pace and reached a climax around the high modernism. Uh, they emphasize on their originality and creativity and therefore they place themselves in the field of restricted production. There is very limited number of readers, very limited number of buyers of their books, very limited number of books sold, very limited copies sold, particularly among the libraries. Not so with popular fiction. They are essentially heteronomous, always obey the logic of the marketplace, that is large-scale production and broad-based distribution. Everywhere you find popular fiction. You go to the airport, there is popular fiction. You go to the railway stations, there is popular fiction. Although nowadays you cannot go anywhere. But that's a different story. But anywhere you go, uh, there is popular fiction. But you won't find literary fiction. All these uh, book sales that happen in Calcutta, you know, these lock the box and uh, anywhere you go, all you read is Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey. Right? Everywhere, Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey. You cannot find a single copy of uh, literary fiction. You can one. Right? And therefore, literary, uh, popular fiction is very conscious of the readers because the readers constitute their market. Take, for example, uh, this. I write for the page. This is being written by Don DeLillo, one of the great living writers in America today, he writes about diverse topics, all serious topics, politics, uh, science. I write for the page. 
That's the best way I can put it. Sometimes I like to think, sometimes I like to think that some young man or woman in some small town somewhere is picking up one of my books in the library. But I don't write for a particular person at all entirely indifferent towards readers, towards the market. Jonathan Franzen almost became notorious when in 2001, his novel, The Corrections, was selected by Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey is one of the most uh, celebrated uh, figures on American television. She runs a book club, which is by far the largest book club in the world, called the Oprah's Book Club and usually endorses uh, one book and uh, invites the author on TV show and talks about that book. And to be endorsed by Oprah Winfrey, once the stamp of Oprah's book club is placed on the cover of your book, it can increase your sales many times, many folds. But when Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey selected Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections, Franzen simply refused to uh, and people were absolutely baffled. He was charged of elitism, being a snob and all that. But Franzen probably did not want the stamp of Oprah's book club on the cover of his book because he wanted to be a literary writer and not a popular writer. Talking about literary snobbery, who better than Henry James? Okay. Probably worldwide acknowledged as a as one of the greatest literary snobs that ever lived, but at the same time acknowledged as a literary master as well. He was disdainful of anything that even smelled of popularity. Okay? He had fights with writers like Robert Louis Stevenson, who was a, a very popular, very well-published writer of uh, adventure novels. And, and he kept writing letters and Stevenson wrote back very well-documented literary feuds. But look at this, Henry James worked hard for four years, worked hard for four years and finally in 1907 published a 24 volume New York edition of his collected novels and tales and earned a royalty check of 211 pounds. That's abysmal. Half a century back, 50 years back, Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton, who was one of the most popular writers of his time, writing uh, historical uh, novels. In 1853, that's almost 50 years before Henry James, Edward Bulwer Lytton received a publisher's advance of 20,000 pounds for the rights to republish his collected works in a railway edition. I'm reminded of, I'm reminded of one very interesting point that, um, that uh, George Orwell once uh, wrote. There, there's a wonderful essay by George Orwell called Why I Write. I think some of you might be acquainted with that essay. In Why I Write, Orwell lists four reasons why he writes. But he also believes that these are the reasons why most author, authors write. And these reasons are uh, sheer egotism. Sheer egotism. So you think yourself someone and therefore you write. Immortality, the lure for immortality that people will remember you. Getting back at people who have put you down. There is uh, someone who has... Uh, criticized you or said bad things about you. You just want to get back at him and therefore you write something. And number four, to make the world a better place. So these are the four reasons why authors write. Samuel Johnson, interestingly, would not have agreed. He once famously said that no one, no one but a blockhead has ever written for anything but money. So you can see that there are two kinds of writers. One who write irrespective of the readers, whoever is reading, whoever is buying. They tend a chance to place themselves in the literary fiction category and the others are 
directed towards money and therefore towards their reading public. I'm not talking about Sabatini here. Uh, now, what about the reading? Are the two fictions to be read differently? I don't think so, honestly speaking, because we usually make this distinction between light reading and heavy reading. Uh, okay, you are reading popular fiction. That means it's, it's light reading. Okay, you are reading uh, Ulysses. Okay, that, that's very heavy. Okay. So uh, that's heavy in all, all, all senses of the term. So, uh, but I don't think that there exists such a distinction. Because if your taste is more attuned to literary fiction, you might find some popular fiction to be very dull and therefore very difficult to go through. And therefore it becomes heavy reading. Uh, we usually make this distinction between uh, railway books and uh, library books, okay? Books that you take uh, for a ride in railway and uh, books that you read in the library. But it's very interesting if you know that uh, when Virginia Woolf was asked that uh, what book you are likely to pick for a railway journey, she said uh, Thomas Hardy's Mayor of Casterbridge, which is clearly taught in the universities these days. So it really depends on who you are. Okay, and what kind of taste you have. I don't think that there lies essentially some difference between reading popular fiction and literary fiction. But here is a perspective. Good reading also demands slow reading. A good reader is someone on whom nothing in the text is lost. Okay? Slow reading, critical reading means being suspicious at every turn, interrogating every detail of the work, trying to figure out by just what means the magic is wrought. But as you can understand, this is very clearly a literary perspective. When you read a piece of popular fiction, you at times need to be a gullible reader. I can tell you one, one incident that I very clearly remember. Uh, Stephen King's uh, The Shining, uh, often considered as one of the classics of the horror genre. Uh, when I was reading uh, Stanley, uh, Stephen King's uh, The Shining, if you know the story, uh, uh, it's about people, a family that is, a man, uh, his wife and his uh, young kid. They are stuck in a hotel, okay? They are stuck in a hotel, uh, totally in isolation, uh, perhaps a, an appropriate read for our times. Uh, so uh, they are stuck in a hotel, totally in a, uh, isolation, and uh, for three winter months, they have absolutely no connectivity whatsoever with the outer world. Okay. And the man of that family, stuck in that hotel, which is named Hotel Overlook, is a failed writer, which is, which is interesting. He's a failed writer and he starts to lose his mind during this totally isolated three months. To such an extent that he becomes murderous and he is about to kill his family. Things reach fever pitch. Toward fever pitch, the man is running with an uh, with an axe in his hand, and he is about to murder his uh, family. One erstwhile employee of that hotel, he somehow gets a feeling that something might be going wrong. He has a telepathic connection with that hotel. So he senses that something might be getting wrong in that hotel and he decides to take his own car and drive the mountainous roads amidst that very terrible climate and reach that hotel so that he can reach in time to avoid a disaster. And he starts driving. The road is difficult, the weather is difficult and the writer almost impishly starts describing the weather. Now, as a reader, you are frustrated. So what is this? Stop describing the weather. Just, just tell me what happens when he reaches there. You have no time for it. You have no time for the weather. So at times in popular fiction, the point is not to uh, go through the details to ponder over every sentence. Therefore, popular fiction is to be read fast, voraciously. You have to devour popular fiction and widely. 
But that does not necessarily mean that popular fiction vacates your mind. It often stuffs your mind. Okay? There is a lot of information in popular fiction. I can tell you that I, I learned a lot about uh, the Louvre Museum in, in, in Paris uh, from uh, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. There is so much information on transsexuals, on sex change operations in that particular novel, Bangkok 8, that I talked about by John Burnett. So you do get a blend of entwining or entertain, of entertainment and information. Right? There is a term these days that goes around called infotainment. Right? So popular fiction does give you a lot of infotainment. And popular fiction does not have readers. It has fans, geeks aficionado buffs, you know, who are crazy about the genres. I, I have seen many James Joyce scholars. I have seen many George Eliot scholars, but I have never seen um, a George Eliot buff, a George Eliot fan. You know? Popular fiction readers can be crazy. So, for example, I myself am a Lord, a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and I, I, I tend to divide people based on Lord of the Rings categories. Like I, I, I divide people, categorize people as elves and and hobbits and orcs and ukais and and so on and so forth. So, popular fiction have these fan bases. But this this picture, incidentally, is one of my friends' uh, rented home in Bangalore, stuffed with books. Now, that's not surprising because we have probably many of us have more books at our homes. But this is all crime, okay? This is all crime novels, and he probably has read more than 95% of all these. So one thing that popular fiction definitely does is it encourages reading, which unfortunately I think is exactly the opposite of literary fiction. The, f the entire field of literature encourages so much of pretension People keep talking about books which they have not read. Okay, they pretend that they have read it. And th this is very appropriate, not from me, this is from Mark Twain. A literary classic is a book which everyone praises, but no one reads. Right? Whereas it is a proven fact that Harry Potter novels raised literacy levels at schools, especially amongst boys. So why is popular literature or popular fiction, as you can see that literature is a very dicey term and uh, popular fiction works very differently from literature. So what is it doing in the university? This is our final question. What is it doing in the university? Why all of a sudden in the university? Now, one thing that uh, you would understand if you look at the syllabus, that uh, the texts that are chosen as part of popular literature course are not exactly uh, popular fiction. They are the, the safe options. You see the, the Agatha Christie, the Lewis Carroll. Okay, I, I don't have any idea why Lewis Carroll is popular fiction. Like Calling Lewis Carroll popular fiction is like saying uh, Gulliver's Travels is popular fiction. Uh, but anyway, you have the safe options, you know, Lewis Carroll, Agatha Christie, Tintin, okay, uh, Harry Potter, that's all that you have. Interestingly, or rather bafflingly, uh, some of the universities have chosen Sam Salvadurai's Funny Boy as, as, a, as a part of their popular literature courses. I don't know what is the reason. But uh, what you can see here, that this popular literature stuff that you are reading in the university is at best a non-entity, at, at non uh, or rather at worst a non-entity, and at best a merger. It's somewhat of a blend, you know. Uh, so popular fictions that have been taken into literature. So how are we gaining from popular literature in the universities? First things first, that popular literature is not gaining anything by being included in the university, not even prestige. Trust me, uh, a Sydney Sheldon has enough readers, millions of readers worldwide. So if he is suddenly included in the university, uh, it will probably add uh, 100 snobs who had rejected Sidney Sheldon before, and now they will start reading Sidney Sheldon. Nothing else. But the university will be terribly enriched. The entire discipline of uh, literature will be enriched uh, if popular fiction is actually included in the syllabus, as it is being slowly now. First thing, it will encourage the readers, uh, encourage the students to read. And I strongly believe this, that many more students have read 
uh, Agatha Christie's Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which I think is in the syllabus, uh, the number of students who have read that book will surely be more than the number of students who have read, say, Mulkaraj Anand Schooley or, or maybe David Copperfield. So it definitely encourages the students to read. That, that's number one. Secondly, it, it broadens the field of literature. Okay? Not merely an elitist activity, but something that is very vibrant, very living. Here is Scott Taro, the writer of uh, Courtroom Mysteries, who was a uh, who was a English literature student himself, writing, was Ulysses really a great work of literature if almost no one read it for leisure. And if the few who dared found it so taxing, what did writers owe their audience? How easy were we supposed to make things for them? And what were we entitled to demand in return? So these are questions that are worth pondering about. Of course, the scenario is changing. There are many universities in the world that are now hugely stored with uh, popular fiction. For example, there is a lot of crime fiction in Columbia University. Uh, James Bond manuscripts are stored in uh, the Indiana University Library. And there is a, a great science fiction uh, repository in the University of Liverpool. Interestingly, there is also uh, a Cambridge Companion, which is probably one of the surest uh, markers of literary success to crime fiction novels. Right? But I would say that even if uh, popular fiction has been included into the syllabi, has been uh, included into the ambit of literature, I think the method of study is still very traditional. The choice of texts, as I said, and also the methodology of study is very traditional. The same old form and ideology readings. Take, for example, this paper, Uses of Madness in Cervantes and Philip K. Dick, science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. We are using the same age-old methods. Harry Potter as a Bildungsroman, right? or uh, the character of Anastasia Steele in Fifty Shades of Grey. Right? So the development of the character. Mm. That, that's once again the same old uh, traditional literary reading. So what is happening here is it's a cultural appropriation that is taking place. So something which is very strongly a part of popular fiction suddenly shows some literary tendencies. So, so, so some university professors decide them to be having literary qualities. And all of a sudden, it becomes literature. And then you study it as Fifty Shades of Grey as a Bildung Soma. So this is a cultural appropriation. It's like uh, calling any woman who is a brave fighter a manly woman. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a gender appropriation. Similarly, here you are having an academic appropriation. Popular fiction is being taken out of its commercial context and is being relocated in the educational context. That's perhaps all right for UG and PG levels. But if you are sincerely thinking about research in this area, research in the field of popular literature, then popular literature, popular fiction has to be studied in relation to the market. You need to understand who's reading, who's buying, why are they reading it, how the brand is growing. Andrew Blake, for example, whose book I have referred to here, studies Harry Potter as a brand and how this brand has totally changed the overall image of Britain. Janice Radway, another book that I have referred to, provides excellent analysis on the reading of romances. And how the reading of romances, we usually call it light reading, only gullible women read romances. But Janice Radway brilliantly shows that how the reading of romances in itself is a political act. It can be a political act. So you are creating a space of your own, usually women who are reading romances. So we need more of these sort of works which study popular fiction in its context, in the context of the market, in the context of the readers, and in the context of the, this entire dynamics of genre within which popular fiction operates. And therefore, uh, if uh, someone, um, like if any one of you 
uh, actually think about carrying out research in future in the field of uh, popular fiction, then this, this can be a very interesting area, studying popular fiction in context of its market. Because by now, I hope you have understood that popular fiction operates on an entirely different plane from literary fiction. That's it. Thanks for bearing with me. And I uh, do have a list of uh, uh, books and uh, articles that I have uh, researched through uh, for, uh, for teaching my classes as well as for this. So I can share that with uh, Mithorik so that uh, if any one of you need that, uh, you can have it. Thank you. Mm. A very interesting session indeed. Uh, I don't really have a question, but I think it's very interesting to think about the, the way we divide popular uh, fiction and literary fictions. Uh, children's literature, for example, makes it much more difficult to make such distinctions. Yes. Uh, because uh, if you think, uh, you were talking about how popular literature by definition is uh, something that is sim uh, written in simple languages, and so is children's literature. Uh, should should I call the Little Prince by South Doxbury as uh, popular fiction, or should I should I? Yes, yes. But it can. It, it, it is often placed in literary fiction as well, hmm. right? It, I have often seen it uh, being placed in literary fiction as well. Of course, these these divisions are never watertight. So uh, what I what I wanted to I think this is something that I implied during my talk as well that these d distinctions are never watertight. But one thing that I think is uh, very distinctive for popular fiction is the genre identity. I think popular fiction almost all the time popular fiction is very genreic. Much of what is uh, what uh, what is called popular fiction is very genre. -ic. Of course, there are there are exceptions. There can be exceptions definitely. Yeah. And also looking at sales figures is, is uh, I think, very uh, problematic. Because uh, if you look at sales figures, uh, uh, the official sales figures are, are, are still populated by Cervantes, Duma, and Charles Dickens. Uh, yes. But, uh, but uh, again, um, I noticed that uh, Dickens uh, sold uh, something. Uh, Dickens is uh, A Tale of Two Cities, I think, or Christmas Carol. Uh, sold around 200 million copies over a span of uh, 153 years. Yes. Whereas uh, Dan Brown's uh, Da Vinci Code uh, sold around 80 million copies in just six years. So yes. if you look at sales figures, uh, how we were approaching that figure. Uh, no, I, I don't think I don't think looking at, at the sales figures is a very good way to distinguish because uh, that's why I, I deliberately avoided the term bestseller because I, I was tempted to use the term bestseller because I find the term bestseller itself very problematic because a bestseller can, can range anything between 20,000 to uh, multiple millions after which you usually call it a super seller. And it becomes more problematic because if you look at the list of bestsellers, which book is the most sold in the world, then it is the Bible. And no one reads the Bible. Like, uh, yeah. pardon me. Again, again, uh, again uh, by looking at sales figures, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez quite possibly sells, uh, trumps the uh, sales figures of Chetan Bhagat. But, but nobody would consider Marquez, Marquez as, as a popular uh, literary. Exactly. Literary. exactly. So that, that, that's the first thing that I say that even if you are a popular, even if you are selling well, like Dickens did, Dickens sold very well, Scott sold very well, but they are placed in. Uh, in literature, they are very literary writers. I think they are all. They also cater to different audiences. The, yes, I, I yes, don't think yes. people who read Chetan Bhagat uh, would usually pick up uh, a Gabriel no, Garcia. No, the, the, therein, I have an objection because I, I can I can tell you that uh, I am equally fond of George Eliot's Middlemarch and Dan Brown's Da Vinci. Right, so uh, I'm equally fond of like. Uh, for, for different reasons, for different reasons, definitely. But I don't think that uh, someone who loves Battleship Potemkin cannot enjoy the bar. Right. So it's okay. I think it's absolutely fine if you if you at times because I think they cater to different sides of the same man. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you you can actually enjoy a piece of very popular music. You can enjoy uh, Gangnam yeah, Style. Yeah. You can enjoy Gangnam Style even if you are a classical music lover. 
but for entirely different reasons. I think they are catering to different faculties uh, altogether. Uh, on the other hand, regarding uh, addressing the audience, uh, uh, I think Umberto Eco in his uh, book on literature uh, yeah. mentions that any author who claims that they are not writing for an audience is simply lying. Yes. That, that's very pretentious on an author's part. Nobody writes uh, uh, for, for uh, only the sake of art. Everybody yes. writes for a reader. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's very true. That's very true. And in fact, there is a there is a very interesting anecdote. If we have a little more time. Uh, that is there in uh, Alice Smith's novel. Uh, which novel? What is uh, it was? How to be both, I think. Uh, there, there is this case of uh, a literary artist. Okay, he's he's both an art. He's both a writer and an artist, much like William Blake. So he is being commissioned by a rich man to make a wonderful book, a handmade book. Okay. A handmade book uh, full of great poems and great illustrations, but it will be locked, and no one will have the key to that book, even the man who buys it. So immediately placing the artist in a huge conundrum. Then do I do this uh, with all my devotion, or do I just uh, do it casually? Because anyway, no one is going to see it. Right? So I think this is very true that uh, no writer ever. Uh, writes irrespective of a reader. I think this is somewhat of a, uh, you know, consolation thing that they say. Uh, in fact, uh, amongst the Bloomsbury, uh, uh, or rather the, the the circle that assembled in uh, um, in Paris, Shakespeare and Company, uh, the the James, the likes of Joyce, you know, uh, Fitzgerald, and these people, uh, it was almost a taboo to be sold well. So anyone whose book would sell well, they would consider him to be a bad writer. I think this is just a consolation for people who don't sell well. Everyone, everyone do uh, write for a reader. That that's very true. I think. And and Echo himself said that I don't want my my uh, novels to be preserved in a library uh, in acid free paper. Rather, I would like to be a popular writer. Yes, classic, I, I want them to be classic case of someone who blends the literary and the popular. Right, yeah. Echo. Since you named Echo, so yeah. classic case. Like you read Name of the Rose and. You are totally blown away by by everything, by the literary aspect, by the style, by the sentences, by the plot, uh, by the amount of information that you get about the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It's it's mind blowing. Then again, uh, Eco is considered uh, a literary writer. Literary. Ever considered a popular writer? Literary. Literary. Very problematic. Uh, uh, likewise, I think Murakami, in his own home country, is yeah. uh, never taken seriously because. Uh, uh, critics in Japan think uh, uh, he's a popular writer and thus should not be taken seriously. He's we, we appropriate Murakami as a serious writer because uh, he is appropriated by the West. Uh, right. I, I, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, if uh, uh, I think uh, some of the students have have posed questions in the chat, uh, and yeah. I also request uh, Professor Chinmoy there to take over. And uh, if Malobekadi has anything, any questions to ask. Uh, please, please uh, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I, I, hello. I'm, I'm, I'm Professor Chinmoyde. Okay. Uh, Methodic. Um, um, I have been disconnected a couple of minutes ago. That's why I have lost the first few questions that the students or the participants have posted in the chat box. So I would request you to, without the first uh, three, four questions, I would, uh, then I will take over. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the students have asked whether the popular will ever be canonized as classic. I think uh, that, that that usually happens. Shakespeare was a popular writer, and then exactly, exactly. One of the best examples is Shakespeare, very yeah. popular writer. Uh, can we call Gulliver's Travels a popular fiction? Because most of us get introduced to it, its story through smaller renditions or, or cartoons. No, this is this is an interesting question about Gulliver's Travels. And uh, once again, the, the, the point that Mithorik said about, about Shakespeare, uh, I think that applies with uh, Jonathan Swift as well. Interestingly, in, in a letter that uh, John Gay, who was one of those uh, people in that circle, that uh, Arbut Knott, Pope and uh, Newton and all those people who had a clique of their own. John Gay was writing a letter after the publication of Gulliver's Travels, where he wrote that everyone seems to have read Gulliver's Travels. Everyone from the queen to the uh, nurse, everyone seems to have read Gulliver's Travels. And strangely, no one has been offended. 
right? So <laughs> perhaps they, they all missed the point. So Gulliver's travels, not, not, not only because we have been introduced as uh, children or not, but also during its own time was a hugely successful book. It was a, it was a very popular uh, book and it, was, it became very popular in Ireland specifically. Okay? Uh, so I, I, I think Gulliver's Travels was a popular uh, book, was a, uh, was a popular book, but has been appropriated into uh, classical literary canon. But I think, I think there is an important distinction that we need to make here. The, this thing called popular fiction, the thing that I talked about uh, during the last one, one hour, this category did not exist. I think, I think uh, this particular category of popular fiction did not exist. Because if you look at the origins of the novel, I think novel itself was a popular genre. Like novel itself was uh, somewhat of a popular genre coming out of the canons of literature. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and novel, I I think still is the the, the most popular genre. Yes. Uh, for example, I don't think poetry. Uh, there there are as as many poetry readers today as uh, uh, we we had in the in the past. Yes, in, uh, in spite of Rupi Kaur, in in spite of Rupi Kaur, we don't right. have many many poetry readers. But that's very true. Yes. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Amitayush asked that whether popular literature uh, has been rendered as a springboard which gets the masses hooked to the very habit of reading, essentially paving the way for them to take up the so-called serious reads of classical literature. I think that's a good way to think about it, but what, what do you think about, uh, about yeah, it? Yeah, I, I think, I think that, that is in fact a good way to think about it as you rightly put. And that is one thing that I said that uh, this introduction of popular literature once again that's problematic but this introduction of popular literature into the curriculum i think will actually encourage uh, more and more readers to read books see ultimately at the end of the day it but read as long as you are reading i think you will develop some sort of a taste after a certain point of time so definitely popular literature can be used as a springboard but if included into the uh, syllabus into the curriculum, you need to be sure about what methodology you are uh, applying. So how you are studying it. If you are studying a popular fiction purely from a market perspective, then fine. But if you are studying it from a literary perspective, then you need to be careful about your choice. Then you need to be very sure what kind of book you are choosing. I think... Uh, just one more question because I have a meeting to attend. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, please, 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 please take over. Yes, yes. Uh, I have, we, we can see a question uh, asked by Gaurav Bhattacharya. Uh, his question is although the features of the popular and literary fictions are very different, it, uh, 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 if possible, to blend popular, is it possible to blend popular fiction and literary fiction? And uh, any literary figure who tried to blend these or succeed in this field? Question number two, nowadays the adaptation of the popular fiction is in vogue. The trend of adapting a book for a show or a movie was yes. uh, uh, it always present from the rise of parallel fiction or it started from some different scenarios. Was it a result of public demand is the question. Okay, um, I don't exactly remember <laughs> the long question, but uh, what was the first question? Uh, the first question was, although the features of the popular and literary fictions yes, are very blending of the Blending of the two. Yes, I think blending, we, blending. we already talked about that. We already talked about that as Mitharika uh, evoked the name of uh, Umberto Eco, for example, is a, is a great. Umberto Eco wants to be remembered as a popular writer, or rather wanted to be remembered as a popular writer, uh, but still is considered as very much a literary writer. He was an academician himself. Lord of the Rings, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was himself uh, an academic uh, Lord of the Rings was very much a popular book, but nowadays it is often being considered as a very literary novel. It's an allegory and so on and so forth. So definitely there can be a blend. I think that's the ideal state. All writers who want to be remembered as great writers should try to arrive at some sort of a blend of the popular and the literary. They should try to simultaneously achieve both the um, uh, facets of writing. Uh, 
but in some cases, writers do choose uh, between the two. And the second one is uh, this uh, question of adaptation. I think much of popular fiction, since they are based on you know plot, dialogue, scenarios, conflict, action, suspense, I think they uh, become good fodder for adaptation for getting adapted into other mediums like uh, films and all. And there is a problem with literary uh, fictions, but that much of literary fiction uh, is also about, you know, uh, consciousness, you know, talking about the characters, thought processes, uh, you know, in, in different ways, which can be very difficult to show in, uh, in film. For example, uh, if you have read, uh, uh, incidentally, Gaurav uh, was one of the people who gifted me this book. Uh, so uh, Chuck Palahniuk's uh, Fight Club, for example, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. I haven't seen the movie. It has been made into a movie. I haven't seen the movie. But I wonder how they have transformed it into a movie because much of uh, Palahniuk's Fight Club is about the thought processes, which are very complicated. And I don't know how they have made it into a movie. So I think, I think uh, popular fiction renders more easily to be adapted than literature. Uh, Gorab's question, uh, guess, has been properly addressed by our esteemed speaker. Uh, guess this is our last question uh, that we can see in the chat box. Shoikot S. Manna has asked this question. Can we consider any children literature as popular literature? Uh, this is very problematic. Uh, this is very problematic. I, uh, <laughs> I, I really don't have an answer to this question, honestly speaking, Shulkar. I don't, I don't have an answer to this question because uh, much of children's literature, much of children's literature can indeed be read as adult literature as well. So when you are considering children's literature as popular literature, what you are doing is essentially to take the children's literature out of its primary purpose as children's literature and then considering it simply as a book and then labeling it as either popular or literary, right? So yes, in fact, classic example will be Gupi Gain Bhagavan, right? So, Gupi Gain Bhagavan is children's fiction, but is it children's fiction, right? Uh, like, of course it is primarily children's fiction, but then again, it's also popular fiction, but then again, it's also political allegory, but then again, it's also literary fiction. Okay, so I think that's it. Like, but in order to categorize children's fiction as popular fiction, I think you first need to take it out of its uh, uh, context of children's writing and then call it either popular or literary. Brilliantly answered. Uh, Methodic? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if uh, there, 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 there are no more questions, then then can can you can you please take over and and uh, conclude the session? Okay. Okay. So uh, we have now arrived at the conclusion of the webinar, which has been an enriching experience for all of us. I have been requested by the senior colleagues of my department to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of English, Vashantidevi College. I would like to sincerely thank our respected speaker, Sri Siddharth Today, Assistant Professor in English, Vidhan Nagar Government College, Kolkata, for his illuminating talk on popular literature. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Indila Guho, Principal of our College, for her constant guidance and encouragement. I also thank Dr. Aditi Shorkar, Coordinator, IQSC, for her kind cooperation and helpful suggestion. I would like to thank the teachers of our college for their active participation in our webinar. The Department of English would further like to thank Mr. Shomit Choudhury, Administrative Assistant, for his technical support and expertise, which has enabled us to conduct the webinar smoothly. I would like to specially thank my departmental colleagues, Dr. Maladika Shorkar, Head of the Department, Dr. Olla Guhoni, and Sri Collective Endeavor to organize this. Last but not least, our heartfelt thanks go out to our students for their active engagement in the webinar. We hope that in future, we shall be able to organize more such webinars and continue our pursuit of academic excellence. Thank you all. Over to you.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's that's all for today. Uh, students, uh, I have shared a link for the uh, YouTube uh, stream uh, in the chat section. So if uh, you have missed, uh, in in case you have missed the uh, any any section of the uh, lecture, you, you can always uh, find it in the in the YouTube stream. Uh, that would be all for today. Thanks, everybody.